You are listening to Torah with Simcha. Tuesday, June 21st, you're listening to Authentic Torah. Today we're going to discuss the halachas of Shabbos. We're going to try to cover it in just a couple of hours. Basically all of Hilcha Shabbos, not all of it, but people spend years on doing it. We start off with a malacha that the Mishnah Brura says is the most difficult malacha to keep. And we're going to see if Dovi over here, who's only six years old, if he could answer the question over here. The malacha is called borer. Borer means to separate. So separating is something which is an isra The Torah forbids us from doing it on Shabbos. Here's the question. How can two people do the exact same thing on Shabbos? One of them has done nothing wrong while the other is violating Shabbos. The other is a mechal Shabbos. Okay, so now Dovi is going to tell us what he thinks. The first one is separating. What was that? So let's start off. Over here we have, it tells us here, we have uh, Reuven and Shimon. So Reuven and Shimon are sitting down sharing a bowl of mixed nuts. They both take out cashews. But one of them has violated Shabbos, the other one has not. And Dovid's going to tell us why. Because the first one, he's taking out them. But he wants to rest. The other one wants to eat them. So the other one's not doing anything wrong. He just eating. All right, very good. So Dovi has informed us as the air conditioner just went out because we lost electricity again. But uh, and it's 95 degrees outside. But Dovi has just informed us that the one who likes the cashews. He's doing nothing wrong. Ruvain's taking out the cashews because he likes the cashews. He wants to eat the cashews. But Shimon is taking out the cashews because he doesn't like the cashews. So Shimon is violating the malacha of Borer. But Ruvain, that's, Ruvain is not violating the malacha of Borer. And the reason is because a person's permitted to separate a mixture by taking what he wants and leaving what he doesn't want, but he may not take out what he doesn't want and leave the rest there. He needs to just eat it and... Here we have the next case for Dovi. We have Rachel and Leah, we have two girls. They're setting up their Shabbos table in their houses. They both are separating knives from the mixed silverware. So they're taking the knives from the mixed silverware. They're taking what they want from that which they don't want, which we said was permissible. Yet over here, only Rachel, who's setting up to eat immediately after the table is said, she has done nothing wrong. Leah, however, what could be wrong with what Leah is doing? What possibly could have gone wrong with what Leah is doing? She's also taking the knives from the mixed silverware but Leah is doing, it's going to say Leah is doing something wrong. What could Leah be doing that is different from Rachel? Dovi is going to give us the answer. Because um, Leah is going. going. Remember, Rachel is setting up. She's going to eat immediately after the table is set. So what about Leah? Leah? She's setting up, but not to eat immediately. She's going to go to show. Then exactly. she's going to eat. Exactly. But Rachel is going to eat immediately. Now, what about all the families where the mother sets up the table, does everything, then goes to show, then comes back? How are they allowed to do that? So right now, we don't know. There must be a permissible way. But for right now... Uh, to keep things simple, uh, the correct way, the best way to do it is to only separate for immediate use, not to separate for use of after shul. Okay, now we come on to the next question. 
Is bober something which only applies to food? We're going to ask Dovi. No. What else does Dov- does bober apply to? Does it apply to clothing? Yes. Does it apply to dishes? Yes. Does it apply to svarim? Yes. Does it apply to everything? Yes. <laughs> Correct. And is a person... Uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, that's something... That's it's very... Yeah. Well, All right, now, we have a question over here. We have someone who says that when it comes to playing cards and playing games on Shabbos, Bowrer does not apply. You're allowed to separate during the game. The question is, is that true? No. And let's hear uh, from Dovi. No. So Dovi says that's not true. But there's someone else who says it is true. So how are we going to figure out the correct answer? So uh, here we go. We have this uh, children's book over here. And we have Bowrer. Bowrer, it says, is selecting separating desirable items from undesirable ones or vice versa in the mixture. And we have a picture of a person who has a long beard and he uh, is separating over here. And we have a lot of different stuff that's going on. We have one guy, he's picking out specific books or toys to be put away. Okay, he thinks he's such a mitzvah boy because he's cleaning up, right? The only problem is, is that he's being a Mechal Shabbos. So he thinks he's a mitzvah boy, but really, this is not something that should be done on Shabbos. Uh, the other you thing... You can just put it in a pile and then you can throw it in. You could just put everything in a pile. Yeah, that's what she's doing right here. So what she's doing might be fine. What he's doing, uh, um, picking out specific books or toys to be put away later. I think what she's doing might be fine because she's, unless she's actually, it looks like she's sorting. She has this pile and she's putting all the blocks in the block thing. So that might be a problem. Now, unfortunately, although you would think they would have some kids playing a game, we don't see anywhere where the kids are playing a game over here. So, but for now, there's no reason to assume things should be any different by a game. So for now, we're going to say that you're not allowed to do it, uh, that, meaning that it has to be ochal min psoles. The only way you could bo- do bober by the game is if you take what you want from that which you don't want. It has to be for immediate use. But if you like playing and you separate the cards, then... Well, it's for immediate use. Like, let's say, like, you're playing the cards and you do them both. That's separating. You're separating the cards by going them on different sides. You're separating the cards by putting them on different sides. We are going to have to look into this. All right, and now yeah. we're going to move on. We're going to look into gonna this. But you're going to use it for... Unless you're going to use it... I mean, either way, it's not bowler because... Okay, so now you're saying it's not bowler. Okay, because so we are... Why because why? Because you want to... You, you want to... Like, you want to play with them. So, so you're going to use it. After they stop, you'll run... So since you want to use them, okay, so we are going to come back to this issue. Because 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 if the person just zooms now and they stop and he doesn't get them, then it is. If what? If the person? Because let's say he just zooms them off. Zooms them off? Like, let's say the car just goes, the car stops. He doesn't run, he's just waiting there. And then when they say to clean up, he's got to pick it up, then he might be using it. But if but if the person um just zooms if the if the person just um the cars when the cars stop and but when the car which the car? Person, which cars? Like if the the toy cars? 
Yeah, like if they, let's say, this is his car, I pretend this is a car, it goes like that, and when they stop, it comes and runs and, and plays with them. Okay, fine. We're going to look into the games a little bit later. For now, we are going to move on over here. The general rule by Bobrer is that if all of these three conditions are met, then the Bobrer is permissible. However, there are exceptions. Number one, it has to be Ochal Mitoch Psolas. That's something we said before. You have to take what you want from that which you don't want. Number two is it has to be separated with your hand. It can't be a utensil. Not only can it not be a specialized utensil, it can't be a utensil. Even an ordinary thing, like a fork, it cannot be a fork. The Unless the fork is considered an extension of your hand. That is when the utensil, when the fork is used only as a convenience. If the reason why you're using the fork is so that your hand doesn't get dirty, but the fork is not helping you do the borer, like using your fork to take chicken off the bone, the fork is not helping you do it, you could do that with your hand. That could be done without a fork. So in that case, you could use a fork. And number three is that it has to be done for immediate use or prior to a meal. The amount of time it takes to prepare that meal without stopping for anything that's not preparation. We have an, some other exceptions. The, the times when the ochel does not have to be mitoch psoles is when the food is in your mouth. You can take out just the unwanted thing, like a fish bone. Also, when the entire food is covered with what you don't want, like the shell of an egg or the peel of an orange, then removing it is permitted for immediate use. Now we're going to go on to some practical shilas over here in regards to the malacha of borer. Dovi has the following question. Let's go to your question. Okay, this is going to If you daddy. take something that's okay, it's got all bad, bad, you take so that's something that you daddy. don't want, from Do we go? What's your question? Um, something that, that you don't want, but like okay, okay, so Dovi's asking, what if you take the psolas from the ochel? Is that permissible? So we just said before, no. It has to be the ochel from the psolas. You must separate what you want from that which you don't want. And we have some disturbances taking place in the back by uh, Yisrael Zev. But in any case, so removing even a little bit of waste. Here's the question. Removing even... Uh, now let's say... Uh, let's say you don't take all of the psolas out. You take the psolas from the ocha, but you leave behind some more psolas. Okay, it's still forbidden. Also, if you take away something which is perfectly edible, as long as you don't want it now, such as the cashews from the mixed nuts, we already did this, it's, it's forbidden. Okay, the second condition is, as we said before, you must separate it with your hand, not a utensil. Therefore, you cannot use a perforated or slotted spoon to take meat out of soup, allowing the soup to run out. That comes from something from a Moshe Feinstein. Okay? And you may not use a pot lid to hold back the noodles or vegetables and just pour out the soup you want. But if you also let some noodles or vegetables out, it is permitted. So the question here is, when could you use the pot lid to sort out the vegetables from the water? When could you do it? There we go. Or is he so too distracting? What was your question? When are you allowed to use the pot lid to sort out the noodles from the water? Okay, anyways, so we said the answer is if you also let some of the noodles out as well. The third condition is you may only separate it for immediate use. Therefore, you may not sort out different meats or cakes in a tray after a kiddush in order to put it away. 
nor may you sort out toys that are mixed together in order to put them away. You may not select clothes on Friday night for Shabbos morning when there's a mixture of clothing. Okay, so you saw Zev. On Friday night, can you get your clothing ready Friday night? Put it by your bed for Shabbos morning. K. Could you do it? K. What do you mean K? You could do it? Well, you could do it. It's a great thing to do all the other nights of the week. But for Shabbos morning, you could only do it if all of your clothing is folded nicely in your drawer like your bathing suits. But if it's if you're taking it from a pile, you have to take the ochal from the psoles, then you can only do it if it's also miyat. It has to be for immediate use. It can't be you're going to use it for tomorrow. Therefore, you have to wait till Shabbos morning to, to find your clothing. Either that or things have to be put away before Shabbos. Okay? Now, you saw Zavis. How old you, you saw Zavis, How old are you? Three. You saw Zavis three years old, so he's just learning this. And Dovi was going to say something, unless what? Unless, um, what if, unless, what if, um, what if you, um, you put it on your bed, but, like, and then, and then you use it, and then you wear it, in the night, and the next morning. So then it should be fine. You put it on your bed Friday night and you're going to wear it that night and you're going to wear it the next day. You're putting on your Shabbos suit at night. You're going to sleep in your Shabbos suit. You're going to go to shul with that. So there's no issue in regards to Shabbos. Maybe there's some other issues with it, but there's no issue in regards to Shabbos. That's what my answer would be. Uh, And with that... Um, okay, those are some practical halachas in regards to Borer, and we heard from both Yisrael Zev and Dovi. We're now going to move on to the next section. Next question, if a bug fell into your soup, are you allowed to take the soup, the bug out of the soup? No, you need to get a new pot of the soup. So Dovi says you can't take the bug out of the soup, you have to get a new pot of soup, but Actually, there is a way. There's a way, if you do it in a certain way, you could take the bug out of the soup. So Dovi's going to tell us what, how. If you use your hands. Dovi says if you use your hands. If you use your hands. The only problem is, in order to take the bug out, you have to be taking ochel from solace. You have to be taking out something you want from something you don't want. So nobody wants to eat the bug, right? So how could you make it? How could you make it that the bug that you're taking out also contains something that you do want? Um, if you just eat the home soup and leave the bug. Okay, so Dovi's giving us a way around how we could avoid the bug of eating the entire soup and just leave the bug. But there's another way you can do it. And this is how you do it. You, you don't just take out the bug, you take out some soup as well. You, as long as you take out some soup, you can remove the bug together with some of the soup. So for example, if a bug fell into your soup, you may take it out with some soup. Or you want to cut off fat, they cut some of the meat away together with the fat. And the question is why? Why are you allowed to do that? Because seemingly you're only allowed to do it if it's ochal min psoles. And here, it's not really ochal min psoles. So the reason is, if you remove some of the good, then it's not considered as removing anything from a mixture. So the whole, it's true, you're not removing ochal from psoles, but you're not dealing with a mixture anymore. Rather, you are removing the mixture itself. And that's basically the reason one may remove, remove a bug with soup. However, it is a little bit more complicated than that. But anyways, what this means is that it is not permitted to cut the fat off where it's connected to the meat with a drop of meat. Because that is considered separating a mixture. And all the laws of Boer will apply. But one may cut in the meat to remove the fat with a sliver of good meat. 
because this way he is not separating a mixture. He's just removing the mixture. Or he could just cut in the fat, leaving a sliver of fat, thereby not separating from the place of the mixture. Okay. Yeah, but that's the only way to do it is if you want to have a fly in your soup and to take it out, that's the only way to do it. What? What do you do? You take it out with a little bit of soup. Exactly. You take it out with a little bit of soup. We're but now that's going... that's the only way to do it. And Dovi says now that's the only way to do it. Unless although he, you although you gave us another way before. All right, so now we're going to move on to the next section. Okay. So, included the Malacha of Borer. In reality, there's two other Malachas that are basically the same thing as Borer. They're just done in a different way. One of them is Z- uh, Zoyre, which is selecting with wind. And the other one is Merakade, which is Borer with a utensil. Bo- so, Borer is when you're doing using your hand. Merakade is when you're using a utensil. And Zoyre is with the wind. So blowing a piece of dirt out of food is, Do- Dovi, is that permitted or not? not? Okay, Dovi says it's not permitted to blow a piece of dirt out of the food and tell us why. I don't know. Okay, so Dovi's right. You're not allowed to blow a piece of dirt out of the food. That's because you're doing you're doing the equivalent of borer. But in this case, it's called zoira. You're blowing a piece of dirt. You're separating the psoles from the ochel. And it's called zoira, which means winnowing, using the wind to separate wanted from unwanted objects. And that's... And Dovi is showing me a picture in one of the children's books where you have a person blowing away nutshells from a mixture of nuts and shells. And the book tells us that it's an Isr de Arisa. The book also tells us that one may not allow your animal to do any of the 39 malakas. The animal is also doing, blowing away the whole thing, and the animal is not allowed to do so either. That's also an Isr de Arisa, something which is forbidden from the Torah. Okay, now we have the next thing, which comes from the Shabbos kitchen on page 117. And I don't know if we have it in this, the children's book over here. Perhaps we do. If we did, it would be in the kitchen. One may not sort out a pile of mixed dishes to put in a dishwasher. That is borer. I think that's borer. That's not zoira. You're not using the wind. It's not marakade. You're not using a utensil. You're using your hands. So you're not allowed to sort that out. Okay. Another thing is a cluster of grapes that has dirt mixed in it may not be soaked in a bowl for cleaning, even if you're going to eat it right away. So what do you do with this cluster of grapes? What do we do with the uh, cluster of grapes? However, it is permitted to wash dirt off a fruit or vegetable under a running faucet for immediate use and to wash off fruits just for um, hygiene reasons. It is permissible even not for immediate use. He's washing himself with some grapes, even if he's going to eat it right away. Okay, and then the children's book shows um, it's under a malacha of dosh, so it's probably something different. So we're going to go on, although it's also by Zoya. What's he doing over here? He's pressing grapes for juice or olive. Okay, it looks like he's doing the same thing as what I just said. What we just said here is putting a cluster of grapes that is dirt and soaking it in a bowl in order to clean. That's something that you're not allowed to do. In this picture, he's pressing groups, grapes for juice or olives for oil. So it's a little bit of a different. It looks similar, but it's a little bit different. Uh, and and uh, Okay, now we go on over here. You may not sort out a pile of silverware, even randomly, one at a time, to put away. However, if they are wet, you may pick up one piece at a time to dry it and then put it into its proper compartment. And that's what people do. If they are wet, that's how they get around this. They pick up each one, one at a time. And then once you have it in your hand, you could put it exactly where it goes.
We're going to do that one more time. So Dovi, could you sort out, put it like this. If you have a pile of silverware, you have random stuff, knives, forks, spoons, and you want to put it away, how could you do it? Tell me a way that you would be allowed to put it away. Go. If I already, if I already picked it up, then I'm allowed to put it away. Right, if it's already in your hand, you're allowed to put it away. But how did it get into your hand? You're not allowed to put it in your hand. You're not allowed to pick it up in order to put it away. So it must be he picked it up for a different reason. Why did he pick it up? Maybe, so, maybe someone was going to trip on it. Maybe someone was going to trip on it. Okay. You know, that might be a good answer too. It says here he, if he picked it up in order to dry it, then he could put it away, but I would imagine if he picked it up because someone might trip on it and he picked it up off the floor, he should also be able to put it away. Okay, that's a very good answer. Dovi has been mechadesh, something that we don't see in this book, and this book is called Practical Halachas of Shabbos. Uh, it's under 100 pages and covers a very large part of Hilcha Shabbos. We will now go on to the next example dealing with Zohar Borer or Merakid. And it has to, it's dealing with Sidurim in Shul, and this is very Lamaisa. Okay, here we have the next case. This is a very common case. Okay, Dovi, it's a very common case. If Sidurim were piled up after a minion, have you seen that? Sidurim are piled up? Yeah. Now, we have different types of Sidurim. What are the two types of Sidurim that come to your mind? In this house, we have two different types of siddur. Before you went to Weizner, we only had one type of siddur. Now that you went to the Weizner Cheder, we now have two different types of siddur. Dovi's going to tell us what those two types are. One is Ashkenaz and the other one Svar. Very good. We have Ashkenaz siddur and we have Svar siddur. And many of the shuls nowadays have both as well. You have, so if the siddur were piled up after a minion, the question is, are you allowed to sort out the Ashkenaz and Sfard Sidurim? No. Dovi says no, and he is correct. He is correct. You may not sort them out in order to put them away. However, if you read a little from each sitter, you may put each one into its proper place after reading from it. Okay? So all you have to do, Dovi, is you open up the sitter. And tell me something you would say. Moda'ani, anything. Moda'ani, matovu. Matovu. Okay. Malchigol, shma ashrei. Okay. Then it sounds like even if you did not plan on opening up the sitter, but it sounds like you're allowed to do it in order to be able to put them away. It's a little bit of uh, trickery over here, but that's sometimes we're allowed to do that. Now going to go on to the next practical case, which involves seemingly mirakade. We now go on to discuss the case of a peeler. Now a peeler is a utensil. We're going to speak about doing bow rare with a peeler, but we know bow rare is done only with your hand. So this, although it is sorting out, this cannot be the malacha of Borer. Rather, it can't be the malacha of Zoyre either because Zoyre is with the... Dovi's going to tell us. Dovi's with the... Do... Zoyre is with the wind. So what is this malacha? All right, we have t people going... No. One second. You saw Zav. You can't... No. Okay. What is it? What is this? So th w this malacha is merakid. So we're going to discuss the malacha merakid. A peeler should not be used to peel fruits and vegetables. Do you hear that? A peeler should not be used. You saw Zev. You saw Zev. If you want to peel an apple, how would you peel it? What would you do? Because it doesn't have a peel. What would you do? How would you peel the apple? Would you use a knife? Yeah. 
The peeler should not be used to peel fruits and vegetables because you're using a kli. You are allowed to use a knife, however. I think because a knife is an extension of your hand. That's what I think, okay? The next thing is you may not use a perforated or slotted spoon to take coleslaw, allowing juice to run out. That's probably a classic case of mirakade because it's something that you cannot do with your hand. You may crack nuts with a nutcracker for immediate use. However, you may not remove the shells from the mixture. Rather, you must take out the nuts themselves. So the question is, Dovi, could you use a nutcracker to crack open nuts? Yes. Yes. Now what's the difference, how come when it comes to a peeler, you cannot use a peeler to peel the fruits, but you could use a knife? So how come by a nutcracker, why don't we say that, why don't we say you can't use a nutcracker, you have to use something else? So more clarification is needed. What's the difference between the peeler and the nutcracker? For now, we're going to move on to the next example. Can one pour water out of a jar of pickles? And the answer is yes. The reason is because large items in water are not considered a mixture. Now, Dobby was not in the room for that, so we're going to ask him. Could one pour water out of a large jar of pickles? No. <laughs> Dobie says no. Now, why do you say no? I don't know. Okay. So, the answer is yes. Dovi is uh, six years old, by the way. The answer is yes, because large items in water are not considered a mixture. And the next question we're going to do for the move right on. Is one allowed to sort out different cookies on a tray after a kiddish in order to put away? No. Dovi says no, and he is correct. One may not sort out different cookies on a tray after a kiddish to put away. We now have a little quiz on this, 10 questions on these malachas that we just learned and uh, we're gonna move right on in the next segment. We now have a little chazara to do from, and the air conditioner looks like it's about to go out again. <laughs> um, so in any case, we have a little chazara to do about uh, the malachas of Zoira, Borer, and Mirakeid. And the question is, what is the difference between Zorab, Borer, and Merakid? That's question number one. So we did that. I answered that. Okay. I will give the audience over here a chance to respond. And then we go on to the next question. Question two. Is it possible for two people to do the same action on Shabbos and one would be doing nothing wrong, whereas the other would be violating one of the malachas? If yes, how? And that is something that we covered. So we will give people a chance to respond and then we are going to move on to the next question number three. Looks like the air conditioner is working, at least for a couple of minutes. We'll see what happens. Question number three. Can you use a slotted spoon to take coleslaw from its juice? Dovi, what do you say? We covered that one. We'll give people... Dovi says no, and he is correct. The answers to the previous one is Mirakade is something that you use with a clee, with a utensil. Zoire is borer, which is done with the wind, and borer is sorting, which is done with your hand. And the question two we covered. Okay, now we go on to question four. One. 
Question four. What is considered immediately before a meal? That's question four. Uh, the previous one was actually question five. Now we go to question six. Can one blow a hair out of their food? And we know the answer is no. Next question. May one take a little dirt if he leaves some behind? The answer is no. If there is a... Question eight. If there is a layer of fat on a piece of meat, can you cut just part of the fat off and leave a layer of fat on the meat? Or is that considered removing the bad from the good? If there's a layer of fat on a piece of meat, can you cut just part of the fat off and leave a layer of fat on the meat? Or is that considered removing the bad from the good? No. So the answer is no, unless what he wants to eat is the fat. That's what I would think. It writes explain as if it's a complicated answer, but I don't see any reason to explain. Question nine is, can you sort out a pile of silverware one at a time randomly and put them away in their proper place? Yes. No. Next question, question 10. Can you separate the cookies on a platter after a kiddish to put each type away separately? No. Correct. The answer is no. We have another malachi here that's also extremely important. We have oifa and bishel, baking or cooking. The malach is known by those two names. It's changing the quality of a substance with heat. We are just going to give examples of things which are forbidden and we'll figure out the malacha from there. Okay, we have many people have sinks with one handle that controls both the hot and the cold water. You're not allowed to turn the handle to any direction except all the way to the right because otherwise hot water will come out. Therefore, when one goes to wash for Natila Siddhayim, he must be very careful not to pick the handle straight up, even if immediately he will push it to the right. So if you want to take a bath, you're allowed to take so a Dobie's bath. So Dobi's going to tell us what. Just that as long as it's... As you turn the hot water up before oh. Shabbos, then you probably don't have these issues. Now the reason for this is that even just a little bit of water... A little water, even if it's not hot anymore, it comes out from the hot side while it is in the middle. And that causes cold water to go into the boiler and get cooked. Now one can avoid this problem again by shutting off the hot water to the faucet before Shabbos. You could do that or you can just turn off your hot water heater. The next thing is one should not make tea on Shabbos using a tea bag because it creates problems of bishul and borer. However, one may use instant tea or instant coffee, but he may not pour onto them directly from the urn. Rather, he must first pour the water into a cup, which is a cliché Then add instant tea or instant coffee, sugar and milk, or I think perhaps you should add it by the cliché these things are already cooked. The instant coffee and the instant tea is already cooked. Or even cold water. However, some are stringent to put the instant coffee, sugar, and the like into the klishlishi. And then pour onto them from the klisheni. We go on to the next example. If one washed a cup with cold water and there are still drops of water in it, meaning the cup did not dry, it's forbidden to pour hot water directly from an urn into the cup since those drops will get cooked. If, however, the drops are from water that was cooked or drops from a previous cup of tea and there is not a lot of liquid in the, the cup, then one can be lenient and pour hot water on it. But if there is an accumulation of liquid in the cup, it should be spilled out before adding any hot liquid. Uh, the next thing is the same halacha applies to a ladle. That if it was washed with cold water, it must be totally dry before putting it into a hot pot, even if the pot is off the fire. However, if it is moist, if the ladle is moist from a previous serving of hot soup, which is common, and there is no accumulation of liquid in it, 
then it is permissible to put it into the pot again. So, again over here we said that if one washed a cup with cold water and there are still drops of water in it so it did not dry, then you're not allowed to pour hot water directly from the urn into the cup since those drops will get cooked. However, if the drops are from water that was cooked or drops from a previous cup of tea and there is not a lot of liquid in the cup, so these drops are coming from drops which were already cooked and there's not a lot of liquid in the cup, then one can be lenient and pour hot water on it. But if there is an accumulation of liquid in the cup, it should be spilled out before adding any hot liquid. So the same halacha applies to a ladle, that if it was washed with cold water, it must be totally dry before putting it into a hot pot, even off the fire. However, if it is moist from a previous serving of hot soup, and there is no accumulation of liquid in it, then it is permissible to put it into the pot again. And f to understand these things better, we're going to have to see the next chapter. So we're going to move on for now. One is not allowed to cook something that was baked. Therefore, one may not put baked croutons, soup nuts, challah, or matzah into a bowl of soup that was poured from the pot. The thing is, this is why we have the ladle. If it was poured directly from the pot, then you're not allowed to put these things in. But if it was poured from the ladle, then you don't have this issue. If it was poured from the pot, the issue is the bowl becomes a klisheni, not a klishlishi. Therefore, it's still considered cooking. But if the soup was taken out with a ladle, and he didn't leave the ladle in the pot until it became hot, that would also pose a problem, because then the ladle has the same din as the pot, so the ladle cannot have been left into the pot, in the pot to the point where it became hot, then one can put them into the bowl because it now has the classification of a klishlishi. The same applies if it was put into another bowl first and then his bowl. Similarly, one may not bake something that was previously cooked. So therefore, one may not put a piece of cooked or boiled chicken or something like that on top of a pot on the blech to warm up because it is now getting baked. It is now getting roasted, which is baked. And it was cooked. It never was baked before. It was cooked before. And cooked means to heat it up in water. Baked means to do it on fire. So, and roasted is the same thing. So this piece of uh, cooked or boiled chicken was done with water. He cannot put it on top of a, the blech to warm up because now it's getting baked. And one is not allowed to roast something that was cooked or vice versa. However, if one has roasted chicken or baked kugel, it is permitted to heat it up on top of a pot. On top of the pot, that you would be allowed to do. One may not take cold food, even if it is fully cooked or roasted, and put it directly on the blech. So a blech is a piece of metal that covers the flame and preferably also the knobs. It should cover the knobs. A blech, being an unusual way of cooking, serves as a reminder not to raise the flame. So there's two things that the blech accomplishes. Number one is it reminds us. And number two, preferably, it should also cover the knobs, which is more than just a reminder. So one, again, is not allowed to take cold food, even if it's fully cooked or roasted, and put it directly on the blech, even for a moment, if it could get to Yad Zoledis bow. So challah, for example. Although challah might be different, we'll see. If it would, if it would reach Yad Zoledis bow, if it would stay there the entire day, and at some point it would reach Yad Zoledis bow, then you are not allowed to put it on the blech. I believe you're allowed to put it next to the blech, however. One should be careful not to let any uncooked vegetables or their juices touch any hot solid food on their plate. Because solid food retains its clearishon status as long as it is Yad Zoledisbo, which he's defining as 110 degrees. 
For example, one should not serve cholent with coleslaw or cucumber salad if the vegetable or juice will touch the hot meat or potatoes of the cholent. The same applies to any piece of hot solid food, like kugel, that one should not let the uncooked juice touch it. Just to define Yatsaladispo, it means a degree of heat that causes one to withdraw his hand for fear of being burnt. And let's do that in the next segment. Okay, here we're just going to quickly go back and define a blech again. A blech is a piece of metal which covers the flame, preferably also the knobs. A blech being an unusual way of cooking serves as a reminder not to raise the flame. And if it covers the knobs, then we said it's more than just a reminder. And there are times when you are allowed to either heat something up on the blech or at the very least heat something up next to the blech. If the item will eventually reach 110 degrees, if you were to put the item on the blech all day and it would reach 110 degrees, so then you would only be allowed to heat up a already cooked item, already baked item, next to the blech. That's the conclusion for now. We also want to define Yad Soledispo. I just said it was 110 degrees, but really there's a lot of different opinions. The actual translation, it means a degree of heat that causes one to withdraw his hand for fear of being burnt. Yad means hand, soledis means to withdraw. So, okay, the Gemara in Masech the Shabbat Staff, Mem Amit Beis, says that this is the temperature at which a liquid is considered as being cooked. The exact temperature of Yad Soledis Bo is questionable. Ramosha Feinstein wrote that according to his personal testing, one should consider 110 degrees to be Yad Soledis Bo. I know we have a Rabbanim here in Chicago, at least one Rav, who tested it out and he said it's 117 degrees. There are other opinions as well. We go on over here. One should not make tea on Shabbos. We did this already. Um, I think we're on the next thing. We move on over here. We're going to talk about Cholent. There's a minhag in Klal Yisrael to have a hot food Shabbos afternoon. And the reason is because there was a sect of Jews a long time ago that decided to reject the oral law. If you reject the oral Torah and you follow only what is written in the actual Torah, which is considered as denying the entire Torah, then you would not be able to use fire on Shabbos. But if you follow the oral Torah too, you'll see that you are not allowed to ignite a fire, but you could use the fire on Shabbos to show that we are people who follow the oral Torah and we believe in both the Torah Shebich Sav and the Torah Shebal Peh. There's a minute to have hot food Shabbos afternoon because how else could you make it hot unless it was heating up on Shabbos and that minhag, the main thing has somehow become cholent which is a mixture of a lot of different things usually meat, potatoes and beans regarding halacha there are three different areas of a blech the three areas of a blech number one, it's directly over the fire number two the area where food could become Yad Soledispo, and number three, the area where food cannot become Yad Soledispo. So we go back to a better definition of a blech over here. One should not pour water into a drying out cholent pot while it's on the fire, or on the blech over the fire area. And that's true, even if both the water and the cholent have been fully cooked and are still warm, However, if one removes the pot of cholent from the fire, 
or moves it to a place on the blech that's not directly over the fire, then it is permissible if the water and sholent are fully cooked and still warm. Okay, moving on over here, we have... It's forbidden <laughs> to stir a pot of hot food if it's not fully cooked. That's considered bishul. Even if the pot has been removed from the fire, one should not stir a pot of food while it's on the fire or on a blech directly over the fire, even if it is fully cooked. Since taking out food from a pot usually stirs it, one should not even remove food from a pot that's fully cooked unless he first moves it from the fire or the part of the black over the fire to an area not over the fire. And I do not know why, if the thing is fully cooked, we know it's forbidden to stir a pot of hot food if it's not fully cooked, even if the pot has been removed from the fire. One should not stir a pot of food while it's on the fire, even if it is fully cooked. So if it's not fully cooked, you can't do it while it's off the fire. If it is fully cooked, you can't do it even if it is on the fire. And with that being said, we also are not allowed to take food out of the pot since that, while the pot's on the fire, since that usually ends up stirring it. Okay. One should not even remove food from a pot that's fully cooked unless he first moves it from the fire. So even if the food's fully cooked, if the thing is on the fire, it's going to continue to cook, apparently, and you have transgressed Bishel. One is, may not cover a pot of food that's not fully cooked. Therefore, if one lifts the cover of the cholent to see if it's done, or just to smell it, and realizes that it is not completely done, he cannot put the cover back on even if the pot is not on the fire. Unless if he does it while he's still holding the cover. Well, we're going to get to that. No, okay. There is, okay. If, however, the cholent is completely done, then he may put the cover back on, but must make sure that any drops on the bottom of the cover are still warm, or he should shake them off. Okay, because otherwise, those drops, when they fall back into the hot pot, he's going to be doing bishul. Uh... And we'll go on to the next part. A pot left on the outer part of the blech, on a place where it could not get to Yatzel which we're defining as 110 degrees, according to Ramosha Feinstein, if it would stay there, the, it, meaning if it would stay there the entire day, it still can't get to 110 degrees. And it's the outer part of the blech. It's considered as if it was not left on the fire and it may not be moved closer to the fire. Because otherwise that would be Bishal. If, however, it was left at the beginning of Shabbos on a place on the blech where it could get to Yatzel then you can move it anywhere on the blech if it's fully cooked, even over the fire. Okay, then if one took a pot off the fire or the blech, on Shabbos, it cannot be returned unless the following five conditions are met. Number one, the fire must be covered with a blech or something like that. And if one forgot to put on a blech before Shabbos, he could put it on, he could put the blech on during Shabbos. Number two, the food must be fully cooked. Number three, the food must still be warm. Number four, the food was taken off with the intentions to return it. And number five, the pot was held the entire time. Putting it on a counter or table while holding it is fine, as long as you're holding the pot the entire time. There are certain cases when the final two conditions does not have, is not required, but in general, those are the five conditions that are necessary. Look at it. It's super awesome, though. Here's that. Um, I'm missing one. You don't know what a generator The final thing is, Dovi has a question over here. But we're going to go on. One may not return the inset that which holds the cooking food of a crock pot to the base on Shabbos unless the base was lined with aluminum foil or the like, which serves as a blech. Preferably the knob also should be covered. So once you have aluminum foil, 
on the base of the crock pot that serves as a blech. And the Nabi said preferably should be covered. One may not return that which is holding the cooking food to the base on Shabbos unless the base was lined with aluminum foil. We're going to go on to the review questions. That's coming up next. Ten review questions. How may one turn on a one-handle faucet? That's question number one. Question two. How may one make tea with sugar on Shabbos? Question three. Can one put baked croutons into hot soup? Question four. May one place a cold cooked food on the blech to warm up on Shabbos? Question 5. What must one be careful not to put on a plate together with hot cholent? Question 6. Is one permitted to pour hot water into cholent on Shabbos? Question 7. May one stir a pot of cholent that's fully cooked while it is on the blech over the fire? Question 8. May one cover a pot of cholent that's not fully cooked if it's not on the fire? Question 9. If a pot of fully cooked food was left on an area of the blech that is hot enough to make it 150 degrees, may one move it onto the area over the fire? Question 10. What conditions are necessary to return a pot onto the fire on Shabbos? We are now moving on to another very relevant malacha. It's called malavain, bleaching or laundering. And this malacha is very relevant because there are many things which we do during the week that involve cleaning. These are some common applications. So number one, it is forbidden to put any water or saliva on a stain on a garment, even if it is embarrassing to wear it like that. Even one drop of water or saliva on a tiny stain is a violation of this malacha that comes from the Mishnah Brura. Number two, one may not rub off a stain from his clothing by rubbing one part of the garment on the stained part. For example, if there is a stain on your jacket, you may not take your sleeve and rub it out nor may you use your fingernail to remove it. Number three, if moist dirt is on one's garment, he may not remove it unless a stain will remain. So if a stain is going to remain, so it's not really going to accomplish anything anyways, then you're allowed to remove it. Therefore, if Cholent fell on one's dress, she may remove it. Only the upper layer of the stain she can remove only the upper layer of the stain, which is the cholin, with either the back of a knife or dry cloth on or her fingernail, as long as there remains a stain on that place. One may not use a brush or rub the garment vigorously, nor may any water be used. If the stain is dried mud, that's a different story and we'll deal with that later. Number four, if your clothes became wet in a rainstorm or something like that, you may not hang up the clothing to dry in a place where wet laundry is normally hung, like on a clothesline or over the bathtub, because people might think that you just washed it. However, if your raincoat got wet in the rain, you may hang it up in the normal place to dry because everyone knows it got wet in the rain and it's not normally washed. The next thing is you may not shake out a wet raincoat very hard unless it's made out of plastic, without, which means without any stitching. You may, however, shake out any raincoat lightly. If water spills on the tablecloth, and likewise if some liquid spilled on your clothing or it got wet in a rainstorm, you may not use a towel or the like and squeeze the liquid out. 
you may clean off the water on the surface by putting a towel, a rag, or a paper towel on it without pressing it down so that you will not be squeezing it out. If one has a dust stain that is absorbed into a dark suit, he is not allowed to remove the dust. If, however, he does not mind that this garment is dusty, it is questionable if this exception exists today since people are very concerned about the appearance of their Shabbos clothing. But if he does not mind that it's dusty, then the dust could be removed, but only gently with his hand, not with the brush or rubbing it out with his sleeve, nor with vigorous shaking. It can only be taken out with his hand and only if he doesn't mind the dust being there in the first place. He doesn't really mind it being there, but in the event that he really needs his dusty suit and has to go outside, it is permissible in this case, in the case of dust, in the case of dust, to ask a Gentile to remove the dust. It is permissible in this case, this particular case, in this case only, in the case of dust, to ask a Gentile to remove the dust. If your hands got dirty with mud, you may not wipe the mud off on a towel unless it is a rag that you don't mind dirtying. You should first wash the mud off your hands and then dry them on a towel. You should first wash the mud off your hands and then dry them with a towel. But you should, you can, should not wipe, you're not allowed to wipe the mud off on a towel unless it's a rag that you do not mind getting dirty. We now go for the review questions. Number one, if a girl has a tiny stain on her dress, may she use a drop of water or saliva to clean it? And the answer, of course, is no. Does it matter if the stain is dry or still moist? The answer is no. Number two, if someone spilled some water on your pants, can you take a towel and press down on your pants to dry it? The answer is no. Number three, can you scrape a stain off your suit by using the sleeve of your suit? The answer is no. Number four, if you got caught in a rainstorm and your clothes got wet, what things must you be careful not to do? So you cannot hang up your raincoat in a place which, you cannot hang up the clothing in a place where you normally hang it up. Uh, you could hang up the raincoat in the place where you normally hang up the raincoat and you cannot shake it out vigorously, you can only shake it out lightly. Number five, can you remove dust from your clothing? The answer is basically no, but if you're someone who doesn't mind the dust being there, then you could remove it, but only, um, only gently with his hand, not with a brush or rubbing it out with his sleeve or any vigorous shaking, only with his hand. If he really needs his dusty suit, then he could ask a Gentile to remove the dust. Most of the following several malachas are not so relevant today, such as manapates, combing, sovea dyeing or changing the color of something, um, spinning, warping or setting up the threads on a loom, osish de batenirin, setting up two heddles on a loom, Oreg, weaving threads into a material, material or putsea, detaching threads from a loom, or removing threads from the fabric for a constructive purpose. However, there are around nine halachas which are relevant today, which we're going to go over now. One is not allowed to use a colored sanitizer in the bathroom bowl because it colors the water with each flush. If you have one, it should be removed before Shabbos. Number two, it is forbidden to put on any cosmetics on Shabbos, whether facial powder, blush, eye makeups, lipstick, or nail polish, even clear nail polish. Although it is true that Hagaona Moshe Moshe Feinstein permitted throwing white talc, T-A-L-C powder on one's face because it doesn't last at all, he writes explicitly that for a woman to color her face is forbidden. Number three, it is permissible to wear photo gray lenses outside, even though they will change colors. 
Number four, one should not dry off his hands or mouth that are dirty with a colored liquid, such as juice, cocoa, or blood, on a towel, especially one of the same color as the liquid. He should first wash them off and then dry them on the towel. One can always use a paper napkin or tissue to clean off his soiled hands or mouth because the color that goes on disposable paper is not considered soivea. Number five, one should not twist the loose ends of his tzitzit strings together. Number six, one may not use a pot holder frame, a frame with which one can weave a pot holder. Just setting up the vertical loops violates the malach of, of misach, which is warping or setting up the threads of a loom. Putting through the horizontal loops violates the malach of oreg, which is weaving, and removing the completed pot holder from the frame violates the malach of potseya, which is detaching threads from a loom or removing threads from the fabric for a constructive purpose. Number seven, one may not pull out a loose thread from a garment, whether it's a thread from a hem that became loose, threads left over from a button that fell off, or just a broken thread. Number eight, if a thread got snagged and the material got bunched up, it is forbidden to stretch it back, so he must just leave it. And finally, number nine, one should not rip cotton on Shabbos. Some consider this as potseah and others included in different malachas. Okay, we now have the review questions. Is it permissible to put on makeup on Shabbos? That's number one. Number two, if one's hands got dirty from cherries, how should he clean them? So we said he should first wash them and then first wash off the cherries and then dry them. Number three, he could, he could also, also using napkins is not considered soivea. So I think he would be allowed to wipe his cherry hands on a napkin, but not a towel. Number three, if one sees that she has a loose thread on the hem of her dress, what should she do? Well, she's not allowed to pull it. Number four, may one wear photograph glasses outside in the sunlight? The answer is yes. Number five, how many malachas could one violate by making a pot holder on a pot holder frame? And what are they? Number six, if one suit has a snagged thread, what should he do? I think he should just leave it. Number seven, may one tear off cotton from a cotton ball on Shabbos? And the answer is no. Okay, we now go to some more relevant shilas called kosher, tying, and matir, untying. It is forbidden to make a tight double knot even if you intend to leave it tied only for a few minutes. That comes from the Ramah. It is permitted to make a bow knot. However, if it is intended to stay that way for more than 24 hours, it is forbidden. Therefore, if you need to tie a bumper to a crib, or if there is a decorative bow on a dress that is not usually untied, it is forbidden to tie them with a bow tie. It's only permitted to make a bow knot uh, if it is only temporary. It's, the kavana is that it will be untied within 24 hours. It is forbidden to make a single knot at the end of a string, as is commonly done to strings so that they should not come out of where they are laced. It's forbidden to make a single knot at the end of a string or at the end of tzitzis so that they should not unravel. That's a single knot. You cannot do at the end of a string. Number four, it is forbidden to tie a single knot at the end of a bag like to bunch up a storage bag and tie its end into a knot to secure it, regardless of how long it will stay intact. So even if it's just for a few minutes, still forbidden. Also, it is forbidden to untie a bag that has been tied in this manner. Instead, one can rip it open in a destructive manner, provided that there are no letters or pictures where he rips.
Therefore, if one wants to close a trash bag on Shabbos, it is forbidden to make a double knot and even to make a bow knot since this is going to be permanent. It is also forbidden to bunch up the top of the bag and tie it into a single knot. So what can he do? So the question we're dealing with here is what's the Eitzah when it comes to tying a trash bag? So, if one wants to close a trash bag on Shabbos, we already said you're not allowed to make a double knot and you can't even make a bow knot since this is going to be permanent. You also can't bunch up the top of the bag and tie it even into a single knot. So what can he do? So number one, he can make a slip knot. We'll have to see what that is because that's halachically not a knot. (laughs) It's not a knot. Number two, he could take two ends of the top of the bag and tie it into a single knot, like the first stage of a bow knot used on shoes. Although it won't be a tight knot, which is why it is permitted, it will still keep the bag closed if it's, n- if it's not moved. He can take a twist tie and wrap it tightly around the bunched up neck of the bag This is also no tying. According to some, one could twist a twist tie too. So some say he has to wrap it. Some say you could even twist it. And number four, you could pull the drawstring at the top of the garbage bag without tying it. We go on to the next thing. The general rule is any knot that it is forbidden to tie, it is forbidden to untie, even if it was made before Shabbos. But there are two exceptions that we will mention. So we said the general rule, any knot that you are not allowed to tie, you are also not allowed to untie, even if it was made before Shabbos. But there are two exceptions. Number one, if the forbidden knot, let's say a double knot, it happened accidentally, as often happens with shoelaces, then it could be untied. And number two, when one's shoes are tied with a rabbinically forbidden knot, like a double knot that was not meant to be permanent, if he cannot take off his shoes without undoing the knot and the shoes are causing him pain, and the shoes are causing him pain, then he may undo the knot. If the shoes are not causing him pain, the only issue is he is not able to take his shoes off, then he's not allowed to undo the knot. The next thing is any knot that one may not tie, he may not tighten. Therefore, it is forbidden to tighten the knot of one's tittus. Here's eight review questions on that. Number one, may one tie a shoe with a bow knot on Shabbos? Number two, when can a bow knot not be made on Shabbos? Number three, is it permissible to tie your shoes with a double knot if you intend it to last just an hour? Number four, is it permissible to tie a single knot at the end of your tzitzis to make sure they do not unravel? Number five, what may one do to open a bag of cookies that is tied with a single knot at the end? Number six, how is it permissible to close a garbage bag and how is it forbidden? Give at least two examples of each. Number seven, when is it permitted to open a double knot on Shabbos? Number eight, is one allowed to tighten the knot of his tzitzis if it becomes loose? Okay, the next malacha also has a lot of relevance. Sewing or uniting two things into one or tearing for a constructive purpose. I'm going to quickly read through them. It is forbidden to sew two pieces of material or two parts of one piece of material together with two stitches such as passing a thread back and forth, it is likewise forbidden to tear them apart. Number two, it is forbidden to pull a thread to tighten a stitch or, or a loose button. So one may not tighten a loose button. You cannot pull a thread to tighten a loose button. It is forbidden to glue or staple two items or papers together. So too, one is not allowed to detach two papers that were glued together like a sealed envelope or stapled together. One would not be allowed to detach those. Likewise, one may not remove the staple that attaches the cleaning tag to a garment. One cannot remove the staple. 
uh, I think there's a rumor that says that one could remove the staple. One may not remove the staple that attaches the cleaning tag to a garment, such as coming back from the dry cleaners. It is also forbidden to tape two things together. However, concerning tape, there is a leniency. If the taping is done temporarily, then it is permitted. Therefore, it is permitted to put on a disposable diaper with tape, but one must unfasten the tape when taking the diaper off. Also, it is forbidden to fasten the tapes to the diaper when disposing of it, because then it will be permanent. You just throw the diaper out. One should make sure when putting on a band-aid on Shabbos that it is attached only to the skin and not to another band-aid or to the other side of that band-aid. That's a difficult one because the standard way to put a band-aid on is to attach it to the other side of the band-aid, but it has to be attached only to the skin. This is a, It's common when wrapping it around one's finger to attach it to the other side of the band-aid since people would usually take off such a band-aid without separating the ends and thereby the original sticking on would be permanent. Okay, so concerning taking off band-aids, we're going to have to look at a different chapter. Next thing, it is permissible to fasten garments using a zipper even if it will be permanent. For example, zipping a lining into a raincoat. Also, it is permissible to fasten two items for a or a diaper using Velcro. Likewise, likewise, one may pull Velcro strips apart. Next, if pages of a book were never fully detached, it is forbidden to separate them. However, if the pages were at one time fully detached, but accidentally became glued together, as sometimes occurs during binding, then it is permitted to separate them. However, if the glue fell on the actual writing on the page, then it is not permitted to separate them. As a rule, it is preferable to open all food packages before Shabbos. If one did not open what he wants to eat, there are often problems concerning koirea tearing and sometimes other malachos that are involved when opening it. However, there are also different opinions as to how to open them. I will write here what I asked two of the greatest poskim. I'm reading from this book. I will write here what I asked two of the greatest poskim of our time, of Shlomo Zaman Orbach Zatzal and of Yosef Shalom El Yashem Zatzal, on what they answered me. I brought to these great poskim a small bag of raisins the size of a small potato chip bag, to which the same halacha applies, and I asked them to show me how one can open this on Chavez. They both showed me the identical way, which is marked by a dotted line in the diagram, okay, which you guys can't see, uh, they, an identical way to rip the bag or cut it with a knife under the seam at the top that is not to open it in the normal manner of separating the seam. So, that is, so we do not open it in the normal manner of separating the seam and to be sure not to rip any lettering or pictures. On a subsequent visit, after Rav Shalom Zalman was nifter, I brought a large bag of potato chips to Rav Yashiv and asked him how one can open it on Shabbos. He again said that one may not separate the top. However, one may cut under the seam with a knife, but not as scissors. Rav Yashiv added that one does not have to empty the contents of the bag after opening it, but could keep the potato chips in the bag until they are done. The general rule is that one may tear open a container of food in a destructive, not the usual way, provided he does not tear any words or pictures. Next, it is forbidden to rip open coffee creamer cartons by the spout. However, if one needs the creamer, he may puncture the bottom of the container, rendering it unfit for use, and then pour the creamer into another vessel. Next, Halacha, one may peel off the plastic or foil seal on the opening of a food container, provided that he does not rip any letters or pictures. And the final one is one may not rip off toilet paper from a roll. In the event that one needs toilet paper and there is no cut paper, there is a special leniency for kavod habrios. He may then hint to a non-Jew to tear some for him. If hinting is unsuccessful or impossible, one may tell the Gentile directly to tear the paper. Also, he may just use the paper while it's attached to the roll and then flush the used part, even though it will be torn off automatically. If none of these procedures can be done, then one can cut the paper in an unusual fashion, such as tearing it with his elbows, 
but should try not to tear the paper along the perforations, which involves another malacha. A Talmud Chacham told me that he once again asked Rav Moshe Feinstein Zatzal about something here, about carrying it with your elbows, and said Rav Moshe, Rav Moshe told him that one could use the outer edge of his hands to rip it. Rav Moshe also cautioned him that he should be careful not to separate it on the perforations, but to cut between the perforations. I'm going to go over a couple of these in just a second. One thing we said is that a person's not allowed to pull a thread to tighten a stitch or pull a thread to tighten a loose button. Another thing we said is that one may not remove the staple that's attached to the dry cleaning clothing. Or as it says here, one may not remove the staple that attaches the cleaning tag to a garment. One cannot do that. That comes from the Or Chaim. 340.14 or the Shmir Shabbos Gehilchasot 28.7 and Shabbos homepage 96 and 98. There's been a rumor that you're allowed to do that, but you're not allowed to do that. One thing that people sometimes are not careful to do, but they must be careful to do, is when throwing out a diaper of a baby, throwing out the diaper, they cannot fasten the tape to the diaper when disposing of it. They just have to throw the diaper out. Once they fasten the tape of the diaper to the diaper, then that becomes permanent. And also, when taking the diaper off, they must unfasten the tape. Be, I, and I believe that's because the only reason it's permitted to put the diaper on with the tape is because the, that tape that you taped is not going to be permanent. And the reason it's not going to be permanent is because when you take the diaper off, you're going to unfasten the tape. So if you don't unfasten the tape, then that creates a problem with putting the diaper on. That's uh, what my thinking is here. This comes from Shabbos home, page 72 through 74. This is one of the hardest ones, especially to do on a child. When putting the Band-Aid on, putting a Band-Aid on Shabbos, it must be attached to the skin. It cannot be attached to the other side of the band-aid. And this we have not discussed taking band-aids off. We will discuss that at a later time. It's preferable to open all food you're going to be using on Shabbos to open it before Shabbos because you can so easily run into a halachic problem while opening it on Shabbos. However, if you didn't, the way to open up these potato chips, you can't do it in the normal way. Rav Yashiv showed uh, the, whoever that wrote this book that you do not open it along the seam. Uh, you should rip the bag under the seam at the top. You don't open it in a normal way. And you have to be sure you don't rip any letters or pictures. And something similar applies to ripping toilet paper but that also must be, with toilet paper, it should also be done with a shinoi. The general rule, again, is that one may tear open a container of food in a destructive way, not the usual way, provided he does not tear any words or pictures. But, but we're also saying here it should not be done in the normal way. It should be done in a different spot than the seam. A, a reminder in regards to opening coffee creamer cartons, by the spout. It cannot be done. If you need the creamer, you have to puncture the bottom of the container. This way it makes it unfit for use. And then the creamer into another cle. That's the only way to do it. We're just going to repeat the toilet one, toilet paper one again. Okay, one is not allowed to rip off toilet paper from a roll. That much we know. But because of covered abrios, there is a way to do it. So it suggests hinting to a Nanju, which is a very awkward situation. If that's impossible, you can tell him directly. Okay. Um, another way to do it is that just use the paper while it's attached to the roll and then let the flushing toilet detach the paper. If none of those things could be done, another way to do it is that one could tear the paper with his elbows uh, where Moshe said you could also use the outer edge of your hand to rip it. 
but be careful not to separate it on the perforations, but to cut between the perforations. So you should try not to tear the paper along the perforations, which would involve the malacha or mechatech. So tear it with a shinoi, not along the perforations, in the event that you need the toilet paper. We're quickly going to go over the review questions again. In this book, it's chapter 16. If one's button is hanging loose, can he pull the threads to make it tighter? The answer is no. May one remove the staple of a cleaning tag that's attached to his garment on Shabbos? The answer is no. What must one be sure of when taking off a diaper and when throwing away a diaper? The answer is he must make sure to unfasten the diaper when he takes it off and he must not fasten the, t- he must not fasten the diaper when he throws it out. Next question. May one put on a band-aid on Shabbos? Um, so the answer is he could do it, but he must be careful to attach the band-aid to the skin, not to the other side of the band-aid. Next question. May one Velcro two pieces of material together on Shabbos? The answer is yes. Question six. If one wants to learn from a safer and sees that the pages were accidentally glued together, may he separate them on Shabbos? Generally, no. Uh, it's Okay. We're going to look back on that one in a second. Number seven, what should one do to all food packages he needs for Shabbos? He should open them before Shabbos. Question eight, what can one do if he wants to eat potato chips on Shabbos, but the bag is still closed, and what may he not do? He can open it, but not along the the seam, and he cannot rip any letters. Number nine, may one pull off the inside plastic seal on a cream cheese? The answer is yes. Number ten, what should one do if he realizes that there is no toilet paper cut for Shabbos? He should ask a non-Jew. To, he should hint to a non-Jew to do it. In the event that that's not possible, he should tell the non-Jew to do it. In the event that that's not possible, then he could um, then he should instruct people they could just use the toilet paper, let the toilet flush. Let the flush rip it on its own. In the event where that's not possible, he should instruct people to uh, tear the toilet paper with a shinoi. The example is brought or either with his elbow or with the side of his hands and do not tear it along the perforation. If he tears it along the perforation, that involves doing another malacha, which is mechatech. We had one question here, which we said we're going to go back, if, which I would have thought the answer is no, but I don't know if it's so simple. The question is, we're going to do it in just a second. Okay, we go back to the review question number six. If one wants to learn from a safer and sees that the pages were accidentally glued together, may he separate them on Shabbos. Okay, now we go back. It's law number seven. If pages of a book were never fully detached, if they never were fully detached, it's forbidden to separate them. However, if the pages were at one time fully detached, but accidentally became glued together, which sometimes happens, then it is permitted to separate them. However, if the glue fell on the actual writing on the page, then it is not permitted to separate them because of other malachos. So it would seem like the answer would be yes, he's allowed to separate them. If one wants to learn from a safer, he sees that the pages were accidentally glued together. I think provided that the... Sees that... One second. It is... Okay, if pages of a book that were never fully detached, it is forbidden to separate them. However, if the pages were at one time fully detached, but accidentally became glued together, so if the, he wants to learn from the safer, and sees that the pages were accidentally glued together, the question is, could he separate them? So the answer is, it is permitted to separate them. However, if the glue fell on the actual writing on the page, then he is not allowed to separate them. So provided the glue did not fall on the actual writing of the page, he is allowed to separate them. That's the answer to number six. The following questions are covered in chapter 17. We did not cover them yet. If I see something very relevant, so we will cover it today. These are the eight questions. If a fly is on the inside of a screen, can you close the window? This is an Chapter 17. May one, question two, may one trap a bee in a sukkah? Question three, may one set up a bee trap on Shabbos? Question four, if one has a new dog, what should, be, what should he do 
to avoid trapping? Number five, is it permissible to spray incesticide on an insect on Shabbos? Number six, if there is a swarm of ants on the sidewalk, is one allowed to walk there? Number seven, if one has a nosebleed, what could he do to stop it on Shabbos? And number eight, is it permissible to remove a splinter on Shabbos? We will cover that in Yer Tzashem at a later time. We are now going to cover another two malachas uh, because they've been a source of confusion recently. So we're going to cover these two malachas and then I think the rest we're going to do for a different day. We have dash and tochen. Dash is threshing, which means separating food from its non-edible covering. And tochen, which means grinding or breaking down substances into very small particles. These malachas are very applicable for we do them throughout the week. Here are some examples of what's forbidden on Shabbos. Number one, one may not use a sponge on Shabbos because he will squeeze the water out. Squeezing the water out is a tolda of dash. A tolda is still a deoraisa. So too, one may not use wet baby wipes. Rather, one should clean the baby by spraying water onto the soiled area and using tissues or dried out baby wipes. Next, one may not squeeze any fruit that is normally squeezed for juice. Therefore, you may not squeeze out the grapefruit half that you ate to get out the juice, but you may eat the grapefruit half with a spoon even though some juice might be squeezed out while taking the fruit as long as your intention is not for the juice. The next one, one may not squeeze lemon into tea. However, one can squeeze the lemon into a solid. Therefore, he may squeeze it onto a spoon of sugar and then put the sugar into the tea. Likewise, one may squeeze a lemon onto fish. Number four, one should not brush his teeth with a wet toothbrush. Number five, if your hair got wet, you may not squeeze the water out. However, you may use a towel to absorb the water, not necessarily press down. Number six, although snow that fell even on Shabbos is not considered muksa, one may not make snowballs or a snowman. And remarkably, this is already mentioned by Rav Yair Chaim Bachrach, the Chovas Yair, who lived in the year 1638 and died in 1702 in his Sefer Mekor Chaim, and he states that one violates Dash and Boina by making snowballs. The next thing is anything that grows on the ground may not be cut into tiny pieces. Therefore, you may not cut an onion into tiny pieces. You cannot dice the oven, but you are allowed to cut it into small pieces that are a little larger than you usually cut it and only right before the meal. Number eight, there are two major exceptions concerning the prohibition of grinding. The first exception are foods that do not grow in the ground, do not have a prohibition of tochen. Therefore, one is allowed to cut meat or cheese into tiny pieces, but not with a specialized grinding utensil like a grinder or grater. Number two, there is no prohibition of grinding something that was already ground. Therefore, one may crumble challah or a matzah since these are made from flour that was already ground, but not with a specialized grinding utensil. Law number nine, you are not allowed to scrape dried mud off your shoes or clothing because it crumbles. Okay, that's an important one. Number 10, and that's tochen. These are tochen. You're not allowed to scrape dried mud off your shoes or clothing because it crumbles. Number 10, one may not take Tylenol or any other pain reliever for a regular headache because the sages out of concern that someone may grind the medicine made a decree that no medicines could be taken except if one is really sick. For example, he has to lay down to feel sick. I think Ramosha Feinstein Paskin that it's 102 fever. But okay, so some of these are not well known. The sponge think is, I, th I think is well known. The baby wipes, I think there's actually different opinions. Here he says, one well, may not use baby wipes. So you, 
like why use it then? You can just spray water onto the baby and, okay, the squeezing of fruit is probably, uh, you, can, you cannot squeeze fruit if it's normally used for juice, but you could squeeze fruit if it's not being used for juice. If you use, okay. I'll just read that. One may not squeeze any fruit that is normally squeezed for juice. Therefore, you could, you, you may not squeeze out the grapefruit half that you ate. If you already ate that, you can't squeeze it out to get out the juice because the only reason you're doing it is to get out the juice. You already ate it. But you are allowed to eat the grapefruit half with a spoon, even though some juice might be squeezed. You're going to be squeezing the grapefruit when you eat it, but that squeezing is allowed as long as your intention is not for the juice. Okay, you're not allowed to squeeze a lemon into tea, but you could squeeze the lemon into a solid. So you could squeeze it onto a spoon of sugar and then put the sugar into the tea, and one may squeeze a lemon onto fish. You could squeeze a lemon onto fish. That's, a, that's something that people may not know. The hair thing I think people know. Snow that fell in Shabbos is not muksa, but you still can't make snowballs because of dosh and boine. And anything that grows on the ground may not be cut into tiny pieces, but you can cut it into larger pieces. You also can't use any type of professional cutter. So you cannot cut an onion into tiny pieces. You can't dice the oven, but you can cut it into small pieces that are a little larger than you usually cut it and only right before the meal. And foods that do not grow on the ground, they, the question people always have is, but what about matzah? What about those things? People grind it, people break it, people cut the bread. So the, the answer is those are things that do not grow from the ground. Foods that don't grow on the ground do not have a prohibition of tochen. Therefore, one can cut meat, cheese, into tiny pieces, but not with a specialized grinding utensil. There is no prohibition of grinding something that was already ground, therefore one may crumble challah or a matzah, since these are made from flour that was already ground, but not with a specialized grinding utensil. Here's something that some people know, some people don't know, and then some people get confused. You're not allowed to scrape dried mud off your shoes or clothing. The reason why you're not allowed to scrape dried mud off your shoes or clothing is because it crumbles. And in regards to medicine, it's a gazera that the Rabbanin made because in those days, it used to be the, that if a person was allowed to take medicine, there's a chance they might end up grinding. They would make their own medicine. They would end up grinding the herb themselves. So even though nowadays that reasoning doesn't apply, but the decree remains. Therefore, you can't take medicine unless the person is bedridden. That's the definition of being really sick. Okay, we might go over a couple of those separately. The, okay, we said the best way to wipe a baby is to spray water and then use tissues or dried out baby wipes to wipe him. That's in the name of Ramosha Feinstein. Squeezing the grapefruit is fine if the reason it's being squeezed is because you're eating it. If you're squeezing it for its juice, then you have a problem. This might be a big chiddush. We know you can't squeeze fruit, right? So you can't squeeze lemon into tea. How could you squeeze lemon into tea? But apparently you are allowed to squeeze lemon into tea. It just has to be done in a certain way. You have to squeeze the lemon into a solid. So you just squeeze the lemon onto a spoon of sugar. And then you could put the sugar into the tea. You could also squeeze a lemon onto fish. So it's interesting because you're squeezing the lemon for its juice, and we just said you're not allowed to squeeze a fruit for its juice. But I guess for some, this is, I guess if you're squeezing the lemon to drink lemon juice, maybe that would be an issue. But since I guess you're using it as a spice or something like that, you're allowed to do it. I'm not quite sure why you're allowed to squeeze the lemon. I don't know, but you're allowed to squeeze the lemon. 
okay, in regards to cutting vegetables into a salad, you can cut it, but you can't cut it into tiny pieces. You have to cut it into pieces that are a little bit larger than usual, and you must cut it right before the meal. However, that's only in regards to foods that grow from the ground. Challah and matzah are things that do not grow from the ground. Same with meat and cheese. Therefore, you could, gr- you could gr- crumble it up, grind it, do whatever you want. As long as you do not use a grinding utensil, it's all fine. An important one is you are not allowed to scrape dried mud off your shoes or clothing because it crumbles and medicine can only be taken if you're going to be bedridden. I believe it could also be taken if it's something that you take every single day. Okay, we're going to go over the, re- the 10 review questions for that. Number one, may one use a sponge on Shabbos? So, of course, the answer is no, but it asks for why. It's because he's going to squeeze the water out, which is a tolda of dosh. And using baby wipes, you can run into the same issue. How should one clean a baby on Shabbos? You spray the baby and then use tissues. Number three, may one squeeze an orange for its juice on Shabbos? No. Number four, if one wants to squeeze some lemon into his tea, is there any permissible way to do it? And the answer is yes. You squeeze it onto a spoon, and then you put sugar on the spoon, and then you put the sugar into your tea. May one brush his teeth on Shabbos with a wet toothbrush? No. If you want to cut an onion into tiny pieces, what are you allowed to do and what are you not allowed to do? You can cut it into tiny pieces provided the pieces are larger than usual and you do not use any type of professional grinding grinder and it must be done immediately before the meal. Next question is, may one grate cheese with a grater on Shabbos? He can grate cheese but not with a grater. Cheese is something which does not grow from the ground. Therefore, tochen does not apply to it. Number eight, is it permissible to crumble matzah? It's permissible because matzah is not something that comes from the ground. Another reason is that it's made up of something which was already grinded. It's made up of flour that was already grind, grounded. I think that's the real reason, actually. Um, okay, as, as it says, there's no prohibition of grinding something that was already ground. Therefore, one may crumble challah or matzah. That's the real reason, not because of the ground. Maybe I mentioned the ground. One may crumble challah or a matzah since these are made from flour that was already ground but not with a specialized grinding utensil. Number nine, is it permissible to remove dried mud from your shoes if it doesn't look Shabbos thick? It's not permissible because you're doing tochen because the mud crumbles. May one take aspirin or Tylenol on Shabbos so only if he's going to be bedridden, or I heard if he has 102 fever. That brings these malachas to an end of dosh and tochen. Okay, another quick halacha. There's a malacha called ma'amir. Ma'amir means to gather. The laws of ma'amir apply only to things that grew on the ground. So there is no problem with cleaning up balls all over your backyard or toys that are all over the room, provided you do not sort them out. And if fruits are under the tree upon which they grew, even if they fell before Shabbos, it is forbidden to gather even two fruits. And the final thing is if fruits were scattered in a yard, you should not gather them and put them into a basket, but you may pick up a few and eat them. However, if they were scattered in a house, you are allowed to collect them. Okay, we're going to squeeze one more in because it's chapter 8 in this book. This is a very important one. So the next malacha is called kneading or combining small particles into lush. It, it's called lush, combining small particles into one mass. Although this malacha has many applications, we will just mention a few common ones. So current day baby cereals, which are fine powders that turn into a thick mixture upon adding water, like beech nut instant cereal, may not be made on Shabbos in the normal way. One can make it if she adds a large amount of liquid so that it will not solidify even after mixing it, and then only with the following conditions. So the cereal is going to be very liquidy. Um, And here are the conditions. Number one, the ingredients must be put into the bowl in the reverse order. So if you usually put in the powder first, then on Shabbos you would put the water first. And number two, you must stir it in an unusual manner. 
that is either with your finger or with the handle of a utensil or by shaking the bowl or crisscross with a spoon, but then you should lift the spoon out of the mixture with each change of direction, and I'm not sure why you have to lift the spoon out of the mixture. The next thing is that it is forbidden to make instant oatmeal on Shabbos, even where there is no question of cooking. However, it is permitted to pour milk. There's a question if that applies to all instant oatmeal. I don't know. However, it is in, also, does it apply to just regular oatmeal? I don't think it does. I think it's only instant oatmeal. However, it is permitted to pour milk onto any regular breakfast cereal, like cornflakes, Rice Krispies, and Cheerios. We have three more things. One may not mix mayonnaise with finely ground tuna, liver, or potatoes in the normal way unless they already have mayonnaise mixed in from before Shabbos. Okay. However, if they are... I don't know why. However, if they are larger pieces, like regular chunky tuna, where the resulting mixture will not be perceived as one mass, then it is permissible according to Rav Yosef Shalom al Yashiv. The next thing is that, so I don't know the lambdas behind of that. I have to think about it. Uh, we'll come back to that maybe. Uh, next thing, it is forbidden to make instant pudding or jello, which will solidify, or instant potatoes. And the last thing is that it is permissible to make baby formula, powder mixed with water, in the normal way on Shabbos, provided that there is no concern about cooking. Likewise, it is permitted to add sugar to a drink or yogurt because it dissolves. Okay, we're going to go over these questions and answers one at a time. Number one, this is on the Malacha of Dash. What is the problem of making regular baby cereal? The problem with making regular baby cereal is the Malacha of Lush. The malach of lush is when you combine small particles and turn it into one mass. So if there's a way to make the regular baby cereal so that it will not turn into one mass, then it would be permissible. The issue is that nowadays the baby cereals are all fine powders and they all turn into one mass when you add water. They turn into a thick mixture upon adding water, like the beech nut instant cereal. So those things cannot be made on Shabbos in the normal way. But if you can make it in such a way that it does not turn into one mass, such as you add a large amount of water so that it does not solidify after mixing it, it's the solidifying that turns it into one mass. If it does not solidify after mixing it, and then conditions then you would be allowed to do it. You also have to do it with a shinoi, that's number one. The ingredients are put into the bowl in the reverse order. And number two, you stir it also with a shinoi. Okay, question two, is there any permissible way to make it? If yes, how? So we already answered that question. The answer to that uh, question is that if you can make it in such a way that it does not turn into one mass, which means it does not solidify, to do that, you need to add a lot of water. If you do it like that, then it's permissible, provided you put the ingredients in with a shinoi and you also stir it with a shinoi. Uh, okay. So our next question is there, what is considered an unusual way to stir? So that's a great question. So there's three things you could do. You either could do it with your finger, because people usually use a utensil, or you could use the handle of the utensil, the handle of the fork, but not the fork itself. You could also shake the bowl, okay? And number four is you could stir it crisscross with a spoon. Now when you, okay, that's not a normal way, but for some reason it says that when you do it crisscross, you should be careful to lift the spoon out of the mixture with each change of direction. Maybe it's, I, I don't know why you have to do that, but that's what it says. We have question number five. May one make instant pudding on Shabbos? Um, and it says straight out over here that the answer is no. So our question six is may one mix mayonnaise into chunky tuna? And there is a way to do it. So number one, uh, the answer is yes. We'll just read this. One may not mix mayonnaise with finely ground tuna, liver or potatoes in the normal way, unless they already have mayonnaise mixed in from before Shabbos. 
It's okay. It sounds like even then you could do it if you do it not in a normal way. However, if they are larger pieces like regular chunky tuna, which is what the question is asking for, where the resulting mixture would not be perceived as one mass, then it is permissible. So the answer is yes. And they want to mix mayonnaise into chunky tuna, yes. The final question number seven here with the malacha of lush is, is it permitted to make baby formula? It says if yes, how? It's very, it says it's permissible to make baby formula. It's just powder mixed with water. You could do it in the normal way, just as long as there's no concern about cooking. Period. You're allowed to make baby formula. Likewise, it's permitted to add sugar to a drink or yogurt because it dissolves. Okay, we covered a lot of Hilcha Shabbos for today. We're going to go and do more on a different day, but all of the main halachas I believe we got... Uh, we will. We didn't cover Makabe Patish. There's plenty more to do, um, and uh, hopefully, Mir Hashem, will get to it uh, tomorrow or maybe the next day. Anybody, if this is put on public, thank you for listening. Anyone who's still listening.